Hi, and welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Winter Circle Sports Betting Podcast. You see me smiling. You know why? Not only did I go 3-1 and one last night, but I'm joined by Mr. Doug Upstone, one of my favorite people in the sports betting industry, and a good friend of mine, Mr. Doug Upstone, DocSports.com. Doug, how are you, my friend? Well, Ross, I'm doing very well because I, the like yourself, I had a nice night last night. Went three yeah. and zero, and so that's been very good. And that's uh, 19 winning days out of the last 29. So is that 65 plus percent? So yeah. So from the sports betting perspective, things are 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 looking up. Things are going well, and hey, here we go, ready for more action uh, that we're going to talk about on Saturday with a few references other t- about the tournament as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I actually hit two college basketball totals last night. Uh, I had the Gonzaga and UCLA game over. I also had the Kansas State and uh, da, 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 can you help me Michigan out? Here? State. Michigan State game over the total. I lose with Michigan State in overtime. Uh, but my college basketball totals uh, continue to roll 44 and 24 since March 11th of last year. That's over a, a year now, folks. And you could find all those picks at rbwins.com. You could also find Doug's premium paid selections at docsports.com. And don't forget, folks, if you have not subscribed to the YouTube channel, uh, take a second to do so. It, it's absolutely free and you'll be privy to some of the best handicappers in the world. And that's a fact. That's not a conjectured statement. Uh, And also uh, hit that like button at the end of the video. You know, I want to thank all of you who recently subscribed. We've had over 120 new subscribers just in the last week alone, Doug. So uh, can't tell you how much uh, we appreciate the support and you tuning in to our videos. And hopefully, and Doug will say the same, we hope to make you a smarter sports better today than you were yesterday, and every time you watch going forward, we want to keep that trend moving. So uh, hopefully uh, we'll we'll enlighten you on some stuff that maybe you didn't know before and you could uh, use in your arsenal going forward. Doug, um, the unders in the NCAA tournament, we talked about this last week, and we just discussed it off air. Um, The first 44 games of the NCAA tournament were absurd. 33 and 11 to the under, uh, 75%. You know, whenever we get these kind of league-wide trends in any sport, whether it be pro or college, I always say, watch out. Uh, the other, the tide is starting to turn. And sure enough, uh, since last Sunday's games, uh, the overs are now nine and three, uh, including three and one last night. And six and two last Sunday. So they, the tide has turned, Doug, a bit. And uh, honestly, I said it before the Sweet 16, there's 15 games left in the NCAA tournament. That was as of yesterday. Uh, I would be shocked if nine or more don't go over the total just based on what we witnessed. Now, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, well, it's, and it has seemingly has a lot to do with better quality teams. Okay, yeah. I mean, it's as simple as that. Is that I mean, I mean, defense certainly is important. We we know that, and ultimately, that's probably what will be one of the leading factors for whoever wins the national championship when we look back at you know at what they did. But at the same time, you still have to score. OK, yeah. and so you have to have that balance. And when we get and one of the things that you and I talked about, after, especially going into the tournament. And then I think after the first, you know, maybe it's even the first two rounds is that the lack of ex, <coughs> excuse me, the lack of execution on offense that we were saying yeah. and that we we're wondering, you know, when this is going to turn around. Well, guess what? It has turned around. You watch yeah. how these how these teams perform now. OK, it's it's completely different. So that to me is the biggest factor as to what has changed is that the teams have not not only better but also they're better offensively they have more playmakers they have better point guard play across the board and that's why scores are trending upwards yeah and uh, we were talking off air and it's you know i did a um, recap of every ncaa tournament game played uh in 2023 through yesterday and um Teams are shooting just 31.4% from the three-point line, 42.8% from the field, and 72.5% from the uh, free-throw line. So uh, those numbers are sorely lacking, but uh, they've certainly picked up, and we witnessed two of the best games in the NCAA tournament yesterday, Doug, with Gonzaga-UCLA. 
uh, in Kansas State and Michigan State. Two terrific games. In any event, uh, anything you could add to that with those types of numbers, poor shooting numbers that I just uh, alluded to? Well, the I, I do know because I had read about this earlier. Uh, well, even, even up until yesterday, uh, one of the things that has been bantied about is that the they're using the NCAA tournament came up with a brand new ball. Okay, that they're using for this tournament. So with that, there has been a lot of complaints from players, from coaches, and it has a lot to do where they're saying that why shooting percentages are so off, okay, across the board. And the problem they say with the ball is that, first of all, it's too sticky, okay, because it's a new ball, new style of ball, okay, whatever. And so that has been a deterrent, as has the fact that the balls, for whatever reason, according to coaches and players, seem to be overinflated. Yeah. So that when they they're bouncing more, okay, uh, fr from that standpoint, and that also has contributed to what has occurred. Now, I'm not saying they don't know what they're talking about, but at the same time, some of this, if you just think of this logically, okay, first of all, a, a brand new ball. If anybody's ever played basketball or any sport, okay, of any sort. That can that can happen. A ball can be super sticky. That I'm not going to disagree with that. But you know what? You play 10 minutes of a game, that ball is no longer sticky. It might still have some tack to it, which is actually a benefit as opposed to a deterrent. But that's so that I just say that's bunk. Okay, yeah. on that one. Okay. The other thing is about the ball being overinflated. Now, you know, nobody likes, to, you know, to, to have a ball that when you're bouncing it, you know, it's like a, you know, it's just like an old fashioned, I don't even know what kind of ball it was actually called, but, you know, that has too much air and it bounces too much. Okay. Well, but a ball doesn't bounce too much when it goes through the hoop, Ross. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it yeah. bounces more when it comes off the rim. Right. Right. Okay? And so if a ball is overinflated, okay, the, the where the tendency of where this could be a problem, it would be either short or long. Okay, yeah. so you, you don't have the correct feel for the ball, but it would have absolutely nothing to do with the ball going left or right. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah, mean, I believe yeah. they call that operator error. If I'm not <laughs> exactly, okay. exactly. Well, well, let, let me say this um, in terms of the overinflated ball, I don't know if that's correct. Uh, I don't know. That's what's being reported. Okay, that's what's being reported. But factually, we don't know that, correct, Doug? Unless somebody is actually no, 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 no one has said on that it. the balls are. No one from the NCAA has come forward to say this. Any of this stuff is true or not true. Right now, if indeed it was true, hypothetically, um, you and I both know that there's something called the shooter's touch, where you know if you put the ball up soft enough on the rim, and good shooters are. Uh, always do this, uh, they'll, they'll get the benefit of the roll a lot of times. Uh, you're not going to get, I don't care how soft your touch is, if a ball is overinflated, uh, you're going to have to swish every time. You know, So I don't buy that whatsoever. I just think that's in players' heads, and I think that's a bunch of malarkey for teams that have shot poorly during the uh, tournament. I could say this, though. Nothing used to drive me more crazy, and, and, and I'm going back, look at my senior year of high school was 48 years ago. Okay. Uh, I played point guard. I was a backup point guard for my for, play varsity. And I saw some pretty good action, Doug. Uh, not as much as you did in high school. Uh, big difference, me being 5'7 and you being 6'3. So that had a lot to do with it. But by the same token, nothing used to drive me more crazy than you're real comfortable with balls in practice. You know what I mean? They were already broken in. Right. Right. And you get in a game, especially at about 10 minutes into the game, you're coming off the bench, and all of a sudden these balls, if I recollect uh, correctly, I used to think they were too slick when they're brand new like that, as opposed to too sticky. I don't know. That's just me. Maybe times have changed. Just a quick thought there, if you have any at all. Yeah, well, well, two things. First of all, I, I, I was, I'm not six three. Just want to be sure everybody oh, okay. knows. So I, I'm six foot. I'm six feet tall, and the uh, I was a, the old six foot power forward. So that's how long ago wow. I played basketball. Yeah. <laughs> and a yeah. lousy team, by the way, too in high school. But besides that, is that yeah? I mean, I think well in today's, if you look at today's, let's just say basketball, it does. It has more tack to it. 
Okay. Yeah. It just, it just naturally does. And so I get that part of it, but again, I just think it's, it's a, just a, a excuse as opposed to just saying, you know what, our guys aren't shooting the ball very well. And one other thing I did forget to mention is that Ross, you'll agree with me on this. All right. If you're shooting the ball from a three pointer from 20 feet and you're shooting it from 25 feet, your percentage is going to drop. OK, yeah. it, it's just a fa- it's it's more difficult to make shots. Well, what are we seeing all the time? I mean, how many of these guys are lined up five, in some cases, eight feet and longer behind the line putting up shots? Well, naturally, the percentage is going to go down the further back that you are. So, yeah. I mean, it, it's not it's not, you know, it's kind of common sense when you think of it in those terms. Yeah. I mean, you look at the Gonzaga winning shot last night. Um, when when that gentleman hit a three yep. pointer with seven seconds to go, nice setup play, as basic as can be, but still was effective. That was at least I gotta say six to seven feet behind the three point line. Oh yeah, uh, yeah so, it, was, it, um, it was long, and, and he drilled it. But having said that, Doug, that takes me to this: has players in this modern era, and I'm talking about the last couple of years, have they fallen in love with the three point shot too much? Are teams more reliant on the three-point shot uh, in recent years than they have been in the past? Uh, and again, why I mention that is your simple logic is the longer the shot, the lower the percentage, right? Otherwise, why do we consider 40% an excellent three-point shooting percentage uh, and 40% a terrible field goal percentage overall? Right. I mean, that goes to stand the reason. So, I mean, any final thoughts on that? And then we'll get to our two games we're going to discuss, folks, uh, for Saturday, the uh, 25th in the Elite Eight. Uh, Doug, yeah. your thoughts? And in- yeah, I, I I agree with everything you just said, Ross. Is that you yeah. know the if you if you're short, I mean, if the longer your shot, okay, the less accurate you're going to be. That's why they keep track of points in the paint. That's why they keep track of two point percentage. Why they keep track of three point percentage for all those reasons. And it's a sliding scale, okay. And the reason as to why three point shooting, well, it comes goes back to the kind of the ori- original original part of basketball analytics was that if you hit you know, you take X number of shots and if you make an X number from three point versus the number of shots that it would take from two point is that if you can be more effective in terms of the number of points that you score. So it goes back to that. Whether you agree with that or not is is another matter. I do agree with that, Doug, because I I look at um, the point distribution of teams. And if I see a team that's uh, 35 to 38 percent of their points are as a result of three point makes, um, you know, I want to know that they they can play good defense too before I back them because if they're not a great defensive team and they're relying on the three point shot, you know, defense usually travels well, right? Or right. like they say, uh, and you're you're not going to shoot great from the three point line every night. So those are the types of things you really should look at, folks. Um, and I think Doug, Doug touched upon that to a certain degree uh, when handicapping college basketball. Anyway, I know three three to four teams that are playing tomorrow have no complaints about the ball because Kansas State, um, Gonzaga, and UConn have shot the ball extremely well uh, through the uh, first three games of their NCAA tournament play. Uh, FAU, not so much, but they're getting it done defensively. So that takes me to this, the FAU – uh, game tomorrow night, uh, which is the early game, I believe, right? Yeah, six, six oh nine Eastern. Yeah, so uh, a real interesting match up there. They're taking on Kansas State. Boy, oh boy, um, who would have thought that we got down to the Elite Eight before the season began, and Kansas State and FAU would be two of the teams, let alone playing for a right to go to the Final Four. Anyway, Doug, uh, the floor is yours. All right. So, yes. So we we have, you know, it's a great matchup. And uh, hey, uh, let's give kudos to Conference USA. The ninth seed team in in their region is Florida Atlantic. Uh, So this is they're the seventh Conference USA team to get to the Elite Eight. And they're the first since 2008 when Memphis used to be at Conference USA. So the first and that's and John Calipari was their coach uh, at that time. So and and then also, by the way, uh, we'll, we probably I don't know if we'll touch on this later or not. Uh, the the NIT has two 
of the yeah. four teams. Okay, right. uh, in the uh, that are UAB in North USA. Texas, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so that's interesting as well. But hey, let's face it, FAU is legit. Thirty-four and three this year. They got an excellent offense, uh, pretty much a high-powered offense, I would say, at seventy-eight points per game. They shoot forty-six point six percent from the field. They make ten threes a game. And one of the things that I like is that their three-point shooting, and this is a big thing that Jay Billis loves about certain types of teams, is they get a lot of their threes in transition. And yeah. so they, they what they like to do, they'll have whoever has the ball, they'll go to the basket and then kick it out to a wide open shooter that's trailing. OK, and he's in rhythm, catching the ball in rhythm, nailing three point shots. So really like what they're able to do. As you mentioned, Ross, they're a very good defensive team, only giving up 64 points per game on 40 percent shooting. Now, Kansas State, I'm going to be honest, okay? They are one of my favorite teams I'm watching during this tournament, okay? Yeah. I love the ball movement that, that they have. This Marquise Noel, he's five foot eight, but boy, he runs the show like nobody else right now in college basketball. An excellent penetrator, great understanding of his position and exceptional quickness. And he, even though he's averaging 17 points per game on the year, and you know we've seen him make a lot of big shots, when the ball's in his hands, that's when he's most dangerous. And I give it to their coach for designing this type of offense to where the players are so aware of the cutting ability when their defender falls asleep, they cut to the basket. Noel hits them almost literally every single time. And Ross, I think you saw the beginning of yesterday's game. What a great opening play that they ran. Okay. Where they that ran the back pick. Noel throws up the lob for the dunk. I mean, it was, it was what a, I thought it was marvelous to see something yeah. like that. Now, Kansas State defensively, they've got pretty good numbers. They're good. They're at 42%, but they do have lapses. And in their last five games, they've given up 89 points to uh, West Virginia. Yesterday, they gave up 82 during regulation against Michigan State and 11 more in overtime. So I think there's some, there's, you know, I think Florida Atlantic can take advantage of some of that in, in this case. Now, I'm looking at the total in this one. 44 and a half is the number I'm looking at as we do this show. This game's going to be on TBS. Both offenses are very good in the half court. And like I said, they're also skilled at running the break. Kansas State comes in eight and two over uh, in away games versus teams that commit 14 or fewer turnovers since game 16 of the season. The Owls, on the other hand, are 10 and 1 over coming off a game in which the combined score was 125 or less points. Ross, I'm thinking another super fun encounter with these two teams, and I'm going to go over the 144 and a half in this Elite A battle. And there we go. Uh, Doug's jumping on that over trend that has started to swing back that way, and I can't disagree with him. Uh, a man after my own heart. In any in any event, yeah, I mean, look, Doug, uh, this this is an intriguing matchup. Uh, my question with Kansas State is, they played an extremely emotional game yesterday uh, with Michigan State. The game went overtime, arguably the best game of the tournament to date. Uh, you may get some detractors who will tell you that the later game between UCLA and Gonzaga was uh, the most exciting game of the tournament. And you know what? They have a good case in that regard. My point being is teams that come off these thrilling, uh, in this case, overtime win at Madison Square Garden, uh, your point guard just scored 20 points and had an NCAA tournament record, 19 assists. That's how good the point guard was yesterday that Doug just touched upon. Um I'm, I'm thinking we may see a little bit of a letdown, not because they're not up for the game, but it's so hard to put back-to-back -back games together like that. You just beat a Michigan State, right? Uh, you, you, The game before, I can't remember who they played, but it was a major conference tournament team. Kentucky. Kentucky, okay. Two big wins, and now you take a deep breath and go, one more game to get to the Final Four. We just got to get by FAU. I, I, you know, so I'm going to have a little small lean right now at this particular moment in time on the Owls in this game. Just for that fact alone, I think they're playing with a chip on their shoulder. Um, the two kids from Harlem had a hell of a game yesterday, the point guard and the kid that comes off the bench. You know, so there's that New York City flavor there. Uh, I think the betters will fall in love with Kansas State 
uh, based on what they just saw in the previous game and playing a team from Conference USA like FAU. So I'm going to have a small lean toward FAU, but more importantly, Doug likes this game to go over the total of 144 and a half. That's Kansas State and FAU over 144 and a half, and I do not disagree with them. I'm going to look at the UConn and Gonzaga game, Doug, and uh, UConn right now a two-point favorite, the total 153 and a half. I don't know about you, but I sort of was a little bit surprised when I see UConn open as a favorite in this game, and I say that just because uh, Gonzaga's brand name, they've been red hot. I think they won 12 in a row now or 13 in a row, something like that. Um, they just beat UCLA in the games on the West Coast in Las Vegas. So it's probably going to be a pro Gonzaga crowd for the most part. Um, that really alarmed me when I saw UConn open as a two-point favorite. And then the more I delved into this, I could see why. Look at Gonzaga's coming off, just like Kansas State, coming off a super exciting win uh, against UCLA. Um, they almost blew a 10-point lead with a little over two minutes to play. Uh, UCLA comes all the way back and ties the game, and then Gonzaga hits a three with seven you know, seven seconds to go or somewhere in that area to take the lead by three and end up winning the game by three. Uh, that's the third straight time that UC, uh, Gonzaga has defeated UCLA over the last three seasons. Uh, having said that, the previous two times they beat UCLA, they followed up with a dud. They went 0-2 straight up in ATS in those games. One of them was a NCAA title game lost to Baylor a couple years ago. And the other one I can't recall. I want to say it was a three-point win. It was against St. Mary's. But in any event, uh, they didn't follow it up very well. Um, here's what bothers me about Gonzaga, and I, I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on this, Doug. Number one, they've got off the slow starts in every game. You know, and they they just they depend on spurts in the second half and wearing teams down, and they've been able to get away with it so far. Um, but the last two games, you know, they win by three on both occasions. Um, they were only up four at the half against uh, Grand Canyon. They were down 10 at the half against TCU. They were down five at the half yesterday. Um, so, and the other thing that bothers me about Gonzaga right now in all three games, including the Grand Canyon game that I mentioned the last time on the air, um, they, they, they lack defensive intensity, which is head scratching in the last five minutes of a game, all three of them, you know, when, when it matters the most, not a Grand Canyon game, I can give them an excuse, right? Doug, they were up 20, uh, it's human nature that you're not going to have the same defensive intensity or attention to detail defensively that you do in a tight game. However, the last two games with TCU and also uh, the game against UCLA, uh, those teams, again, were scoring on the majority of their offensive possessions down the stretch. And eventually, if you keep playing that style of basketball, and just depending on your shooting prowess and offensive prowess to get by, it's going to bite you in the behind sooner or later. So in UConn's a type, look, here's the thing. And this is going to sound absurd. Gonzaga is number one in adjusted offensive efficiency in the nation. They're num the number one scoring team in the nation. But I think right now, at this particular moment in time, in recent games, that the offense in this game between these two clubs is a wash because UConn has been, I mean, in their three tournament games, they're they're playing terrific, okay, uh, offensively and defensively. That's the difference. Uh, I mean, UConn's won by 15, 23, and 24 points in the first three games. And uh, this is a team that's shooting 44.8% from three the three-point line in the tournament. We're talking about teams struggling in the NCAA tournament. At the three-point line, not UConn. So uh, I think the combination of, I think UConn can play with them offensively, and I think the difference will be down the stretch is UConn's ability to get stops at critical times. And don't underestimate uh, the ability of UConn to hit the offensive glass. They're the number two offensive rebounding team in the country, 
And uh, Gonzaga, as you alluded to in our last show, Doug, uh, they have size, but they don't have that rim protector. They don't have, I mean, Drew Timmy is really cagey around the rim, right? Uh, he gets it done. One of the better big men in the country offensively. But he's not a shot blocker. He's not, he does block shots. We've seen it the last two games. But he's not a kind of guy who's going to change a big man shot. You know what I mean? Uh, there's guys that don't necessarily have to block a shot because they're so intimidating and they're so good defensively, it alters their shot. So as a result, I'm going to go with UConn here. And uh, right now they're minus 135 on the money line. I would say, folks, if they stay 133, even 140 and below, take UConn on the money line. If it goes any higher than that, usually that will be precipitated by a move on the point spread as well, I like UConn up to as much as a three-point favorite in this game. And I also like UConn. Uh, I'd like them even more if we can get them at money line price of 140 or less, which I got today at minus 135. Your thoughts, Doug? Yeah, I, on that, well, I, I think they were, Gonzaga was also somewhat fortunate. Now, they uh, against UCLA, they were down 13 at the half, as you mentioned, and they came back. Now, one of the big things, though, in that game, which, you know, I gave out, when I gave out the free pick on Monday, I said, you know, I my pick was based on if Singleton played or didn't. OK, Singleton yeah. did play, but I did not know that the UCLA big man, even though he was questionable, was he was, ends up being the player that doesn't play. And and that's the key reason why Timmy ended up with 36 points, yeah. because they had nobody of size to compete with him. And like you said, especially as good as he is around the basket, you know, left, right hand, bank shots, the works. Uh, Kentucky, or excuse me, Connecticut has those guys yeah. okay, that can make life tough. The other thing that Connecticut is really good at is that they make it more difficult to create entry level passes down into the paint area. So with that being the case, they're just they're just more more skilled at it. They use their hands better from that standpoint. And then they also have a tendency to be better at collapsing. Now, Timmy's a pretty good passer out of the post, but, you know, he's not like a NBA player out of the post, you know, a, a top level center, if you will, or forward. So from that standpoint, they, they can take away some things away from, from uh, Gonzaga in terms of what they like to do, which places all the pressure on their guards in order to perform well. And I think that's where, that's where the game comes down to. And I, I agree with you, Ross, Connecticut to me looks like the play in this game. Connecticut looks like a national champion to me right now. Well, right. Um, there's still a lot of basketball yet to be played. And, and I know you like Gonzaga going into the tournament. And you, right. Yeah. I, and that's okay because it won't be the first time you're right and I'm wrong. But, well, no, well, the other thing too, I didn't know they were going to get in a region with this team. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah. Um, so I'm looking forward to this matchup, both matchups, actually. I love the fact that you got two premier teams in one game and two teams nobody expected to be there in the other. Uh, it, it, it really – uh, some diverse uh, two games that we're going to be watching tomorrow in terms of uh, expectancy level before the season began. So yeah, it, look it, it, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Go ahead Doug. No, I, and just to, to your point as to what you're talking about, Connecticut. So the last time Connecticut won in the tournament, three games, the first three games by 15 points or more was 2004. And oh, by the way, they, were they won a national champions championship. Yeah, that exactly. year. so that's something to keep in mind, too, about this game and possibly if they win this game and going forward. Yeah, you also got to I mean, again, sometimes we get when I alluded to the fact that Gonzaga is number one in adjusted offensive efficiency and scoring. Hey, look, um, they're still a great offensive team. But the bottom line is, is that. Uh, if you compare the two offensively, you're going to say, and you look at the season resume, Gonzaga is superior to everybody, right? But you look at how, I mean, Gonzaga is still shooting 49% in the tournament, but you can, I have it right here. Uh, I, I mentioned what, look, 81 points per game, uh, shooting 52.9% from the field, 44.8% from the three-point line, and 83.3% from the free throw line. You wonder why they're blowing teams out so far? fundamentally sound basketball. And I think uh, you, uh, Doug made a great point of the big men from UConn uh, are more than capable uh, of uh, shutting or making life difficult for a Drew Timmy. Tim, a Drew Timmy to me, and again, 
Uh, I'm gonna we'll go to our promos right after this. But Drew Timmy to me is another one of the long line of Gonzaga basketball players that are tremendous at the college level, but will be hard pressed to make it in the NBA or uh, etch themselves into a really good role in the NBA. So we'll see. I might be wrong. Um, nothing against the kid; he's a great college player, but I just don't see. I don't know where where you put him in in the NBA game. He's not a power forward. He's not he do, he's not athletic enough to do it at center. I mean, I guess he could be a backup. But any thoughts yeah. on that, Doug? Real yeah, quick, no, I I I think like a lot of these different guys from Gonzaga, uh, especially the quote unquote white players, uh, yeah. he's going to end up as a backup, and and that's mm-hmm. fine. You could you could play ten years. That'd be a pretty nice career. Uh, sure. to, do, to do that so all right let me i know we're running out of time so let me get to it so it's doug upstone at doc sports uh, uh coming your way and uh so i've won th- uh, each of the last three days in college basketball and so i got a six unit play going tonight that's that's available it's uh, it's one of the one of the two later games that for on friday night so we got that nba continue to roll 24 and 11 uh inside of that is 11 and three streaks so uh up almost four thousand dollars in terms of profit so nba can continues to roll and i got a five unit play going tonight and of course i'll have something on the weekend too nhl still going strong had a winner last night with vancouver they won seven to two so yeah so i'm in a really good spot and as i mentioned won 19 of the last 29 days including all sports so that's like i said 65 plus percent ross take it away yeah i mean that's great stuff doug doug is locked in and again folks DocSports.com. It's DocSports.com, where Doug also does a daily video uh, Tuesday through Sunday. Um, great stuff he puts out. Little five minute video, uh, but you know, straight to the point, informative, and he's got a pretty damn good record when it comes to free picks too. Uh, in any event, you could find me at RBWins.com. That's RBWins.com. Uh, college basketball totals just continue to roll. Like I mentioned earlier, 44 and 24 since March 11th of last year. That's 64% folks. Um, for those of you who see this in time, I do have a winning college basketball total in the NCAA tournament tonight. As a matter of fact, I got two of them and uh, I got four picks in all a pick in each game on Friday evening. I'll also have uh, picks on both games in the Elite Eight on Saturday. I'll be back tomorrow morning on the Winner's Circle with Jesse Shule, and we'll be uh, previewing and giving you our free picks on some Sunday Elite Eight games. Don't know the matchups yet, but they promise to be good. And uh, also, uh, my NBA totals, 9-4 and four to last 13. Uh, college basketball, 10-star top plays, 110-82 and 82 with my w- last 192. That goes back the 2019 uh it's good for 57 percent and make a hell of a lot of money folks and nba 10 star top plays 26 and 14 with my last 40 that's good for 65 percent so folks i don't know what you're waiting for we're winning it's docsports.com rbwins.com that's where you can find our premium pay selections Uh, Our free picks are great. We've been winning, okay, with our free picks on this channel. Uh, Doing very well, as a matter of fact. And uh, again, folks, I appreciate all the new subscribers out there. I appreciate all the old subscribers out there. And if you haven't subscribed, what are you waiting for? You're watching this. It's a sports betting show. And you're watching it because you like sports betting, not because you're a NASCAR fan, okay? I'm just making it. uh, No, no, no. Ah, boy, I got myself in trouble with that one. Anyway, the Ar- the Arkansas fans are really hating me now, Doug. I went against her team yesterday. They got blown out. I try to make amends with them, but uh, they're not. They don't want to hear it. Anyway, for Doug Upstone and Ross Benjamin, we like to wish each and every one of you all the very best. Take care and God bless, folks. <laughs>